This is Florida Gulf Coast University. I'm going to read two short chapters from my new book called Mad, Mad Love. The first chapter is a little lighter, and the second one is a few chapters later in the book and is a little more serious. Um, and the chapter titles are kind of long. The title of the first chapter is I Hope Your First Kiss Went a Little Better Than Mine Did. According to my mother, my first kiss happened on a Saturday in July. The weather, steamy, blacktop melting, jungle gym scorching, New York City sunshine. The setting, the 52nd straight playground in Queens, good on the sand quotient, but high on the rats. The kisser, Hector Drake's, cute, but a little bit smelly, like wet blankets and cottage cheese. The event, one sopping, clammy-lipped, deranged, lunging kiss directly on my lips. I bit him. <laughs> I was three. A mark bloomed on his arm like two tiny purple smiles, and he cried for half an hour. But my mother felt no pity for him. In fact, she swelled with pride. Even at that young age, I knew you understood patriarchal gender roles and the necessity of girls and women to fight for our freedom, equality, and personal space, she'd say, whenever she retold the story. Plus, he smelled weird. I would have bit him, too, she said. My mom is a professor of women's studies at Queens College. While other newborns were happily drifting to sleep to the lilting rhymes of Goodnight Moon, my mom read to me in my crib, from Simone de Beauvoir, Betty Friedan, and Carol Gilligan. There's a photo of her nursing me while highlighting passages of the second sex, leaving stray pen marks in my fat cheeks. In our living room, there's a picture of me in my stroller at a women's rights march in Washington, clutching a sign with my green toddler mittens that said, well-behaved women seldom make history. <laughs> and so when I turned 12 three years ago, and began what my mom termed your ultimate rebellion. She said that the method I chose was particularly insidious. Shoplifting, odd piercings, even full body tattoos would have been preferable to what I did. I fell in love with romance novels. <laughs> it wasn't even just regular book love. I was mad for them, head over heels, obsessed. I read them in the grocery aisles, on subways, buses, in the bathroom, between classes, and most often curled up in bed. Over the next three years, I read 182 of them, not counting those I read twice. I discovered my first romance novel on the shelves of my best friend Annie Kim's apartment. She has three sisters. Jenny, the oldest, saw me gazing at the vast array of pink and purple spines and handed me Cowboys on Fire, Volume 1. <laughs> With bare-chested cowboy cow, and gold belt buckled Cowboy Ewing on the cover. I would come to know Cal and Ewing with a passion that bordered on the scientific. <laughs> Here, Jenny said, you have to read this. Slowly, my room became plastered with posters of Cal and Ewing on horseback, riding bulls one-handed and roping calves, of Sir Richard from Torrid Tomorrow, who led a double life as the pirate Diablo, <laughs> and Gerlag, who was raised by wolves and known as the Wilderness Rogue. <laughs> my mother would come into my room and gaze at Ewing on his bronco, or Gerlag swimming from a tree, and sigh, I didn't raise you to worship imbecilic apes. <laughs> Other times, she'd grow more serious looking at the posters. I failed you as a mother, as a woman, and as a citizen of this world, she'd say. <laughs> It wasn't true. I called myself a feminist, to her at least. To my friends, it would be like calling myself a maiden or some other dusty, crusty, ancient word. At school, I was quick to point out whenever boys dominated class discussions or girls were excluded from handball games. And when a flasher was spotted in her schoolyard three times in one month, I organized a Take Back the Yard march in which 45 seventh graders paraded around the junior high school 125 grounds chanting, Girls on guard, take back the yard. And dude, put some clothes on. <laughs> the flasher was undeterred, but eventually caught and prosecuted. Still, my mother was continually troubled by my books. 
that eternal happiness can only be found with the love of the man is the greatest fallacy in our society, she told me. Eternal romance is an illusion designed to dupe women into conforming to traditional roles, she said. But you haven't even read any romance novels, I said. She picked up the latest one I had lying around, and inevitably, as if possessed by a magic honing sense, turned to the worst sentences in the entire book. <laughs> she read, <coughs> Sir Richard's chest sparkled with man <laughs> Lady Lilith, it may hurt you when I burst thy womanhood. <laughs> hurt me, Lily Lilith, Lady Lilith breathed. Her rosy domes undulated like the sea, as they joined each other in a love that vanquished every sorrow known on earth. <laughs> the rest of the book is filled with the historical portrait of 19th century English society, I said. <laughs> and Lady Lilith is completely treated as in the relationship and is on the forefront of the suffrage movement. <laughs> I pointed out that my mother ignored my explanations and tried to get me to read Girls Be Strong, a feminist guide for youngsters, instead. <laughs> Girls Be Strong wasn't a bad book. It had some semi-interesting advice about how a boy stealing your scarf may mean that he likes you, but you're still entitled to tell him to get the hell out of your way. <laughs> and it included a funny piece by Gloria Steinem called If Men Could Menstruate, <laughs> which said, guys would brag, I'm a three-pad man. <laughs> or answer praise to a buddy, man, you looking good, by giving fives and saying, yeah, man, I'm on the brag. <laughs> but it wasn't exactly a romantic book. <laughs> the real problem was that I believed in love, in great love. I had a trickle of hope always that the future would be filled with romance. I didn't expect to meet a Sir Richard or a Cowboy Cal exactly, but didn't seem entirely impossible either. Looking back, my mother and my best friend Annie say that the events of last summer all started because of the 182 romance novels percolating in, my mom would say polluting, my brain. I don't think so, though. It wasn't Richard, Cal, Ewing, or Gerlag who inspired me to follow Will to California. It was my father. And this is just a few chapters later in the book where it gets a little bit more serious. When people ask how my father died, I lie. I say he died of a heart attack in, my, in his sleep. When I used to say the truth, when I used to say plane crash, there was always this look. Shock at first, mouths opening slightly, eyes widening, startled. They lean forward, arms tight. Then I'd see it, <coughs> flash, this unbearable, hungry, eager excitement. They'd want to know what kind of plane, how big it was, where it was going, what went wrong. They wanted to know more of this freakish thing that didn't happen to real people, not in real life, not to anyone they'd ever met, it did not. I understand the curiosity, I mean, I do it too, who doesn't click on links to freakish things, kids falling down wells, burn victims or serial killers. People always ask bits and facts about the plane, but what they really want to know is what it would feel like to die like that, to fall from the sky, how it would be to die that way. The heart attack was in his sleep, so he never felt a thing, I tell them. Peacefully, rest in peace. For a while, I couldn't stop thinking about those words, rest in peace, couldn't get them out of my head. The airline officials asked my mom for items so he could be identified. Hairs from a comb, from a comb toothbrush. She gathered these things into Ziploc baggies, specks of our father. Specks because there might be nothing of him left from the impact, nothing but other matching specks. They didn't confirm the DNA for months. The passenger list is the only confirmation we have until they're able to identify remains, the grief counselor said. Her bosom was the size of a jumbled loaf of Wonder Bread. I called her Wonder Boob. <laughs> Wonder Boob liked to tell my mom and me things like, you need to make time to do your grief work as if it was something I could add to my homework list after math and earth science. And she said, I'll keep you updated on the status of his remains. She really liked the word remains. You think that adults, social workers, grief counselors, people whose job it is to make you feel better, you think they'd come up with a better word than remains. During that time, before they identified his remains, I was certain he was alive. I saw him everywhere around the city. I followed a man in a suit into a subway car thinking it was him. I saw him in a taxi whizzing over the 59th Street Bridge. 
and a booth at McDonald's. It was never him. Three months after the crash, they identified remains as my father's. I try not to think about it. I don't think about it. I'm okay not thinking about it. And then I see a girl my age with her father, and it's like someone's pulling intestines out with their teeth. There's a KFC on my walk home from the 52nd Street subway station. But sometimes I glance in the window and see them. Girls with their dads doing the tiniest, most boring thing like sharing chicken wings. And I don't even like chicken wings. And I watch them hungrily through the window, wanting to soak up all this fatherness this luxurious fatherness they don't even appreciate. Usually they're not even talking to their dads. They're texting or playing a video game in their laps and it kills me. Don't they know I want to shake them? Don't they know how lucky they are to sit in the KFC with their fathers? After they confirmed the remains, this is what my mom did. She got rid of everything. All his clothes, all his books, everything my father touched went in the garbage or in a queen's thrifty thrift truck. I snuck a few things away before she could throw them out. I hid them in a purple shoebox in my bottom drawer. Things I kept. Brooklyn Bridge paperweight, white Hanes t-shirt soft as silk, spare glasses with brown plastic frames and scra scratched lenses, a horseshoe necklace he gave me for Hanukkah, striped silk tie, plastic dinosaur from the Museum of Natural History. I take them out and look at them sometimes. I touch the paperweight and dinosaur and t-shirt and lie in my bed, holding them. My mom had no idea I had this stuff. Two years after he died, we moved to a new apartment. I started high school, and that's when I began saying, heart attack. A heart attack in his sleep at the hospital. He'd gone into the hospital with chest pains and had the heart attack there, in a comfortable hospital room with yellow walls and striped curtains separating the beds. I'd only been to a hospital once when Aunt Janet had a fibroid removed, and this is what I pictured. It was a quiet room with a flower painting and a window and an East River view. Caring nurses comforted me and my mother, and we held his hand and said goodbye, and I kissed his forehead. I know the whole scenario. I almost believed it myself. I called it his passing. I heard someone say that once, his passing, about their father who had a heart attack in his sleep, and I envied it. I actually envied how someone else's father died. I couldn't help but envy it. The passing, the peaceful transition between life and death. Rest in peace. That's how I wanted it to be.